Our scripture reading this morning is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 15. Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. Jesus answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed from that moment. I want to let you all in on some behind-the-scenes intel about how our Sunday worship services are created each week. Usually, Pastor Jen and I will try to carve out two sessions over the course of the year where we will do planning for hours and hours over the course of five days to map out our sermon series ideas and all of our scripture passages and special Sundays like Animal Blessing Sunday. And then we'll try to take notes of some of the major spiritual or theological themes that we want to emphasize that day. And we'll plan it out for six months at a time. And we'll take all that information and we'll put it into an online worship planning document. And from there, our absolutely amazing music staff, our directors of music and fine arts, David and Alex, and our organist, Carrie, will take that information and start plugging in the hymns and the postludes and the preludes and the guest musicians and the choral anthems. And they'll do their best to make sure all the music matches the spiritual and theological themes for the day. Then each week on Mondays, Pastor Jen will create a more detailed outline of the upcoming service. She'll write out all the liturgy, like the prayers and the call to worship that we'll use. She'll send that to Jasmine, our office manager, who will create the first draft of our bulletin. And then on Tuesday mornings, we gather the whole staff of the church together. We talk about everything that's happening that week, all of the events being held on campus and what our building manager needs to fix and what's the financial health of the church. And from there, we go into a worship planning meeting with Jen and our music directors and Nancy, our director of children, youth, and families. And we begin the meeting each week by taking a few minutes to discuss the prior Sunday. We'll talk about what went well, what didn't go well, and then we'll go into the following Sunday. And this last week during our meeting, I was lamenting the fact that we never get the chance to just sit back and appreciate how well the service before went because we're always rushing into the very next week. I mean, choir, for goodness sake, after you finish, you go right into the choir room and start rehearsing the next choral anthem 10 minutes after the service. You never get to enjoy the fact that you do such an amazing job before we go right into the next Sunday. There's a joke among pastors that somehow Sunday comes with great regularity, like every seven days or something like that, without fail. So during our worship planning meeting, we'll quickly go from the last Sunday to the upcoming service. We want to make sure we know how everything's going to flow. And then we'll touch base on the big questions for services farther into the future. And then when we break from there, Nancy will go on to make sure the Sunday school classrooms are ready to go. And Jasmine will finalize the bulletins and the PowerPoint. And then on Sunday... Sunday is when so many people jump into action. So many other staff members come on Sunday, from our live stream director who's back in the media booth to our nursery care providers, our barista, our ASL interpreters, who will go through all the material to prepare for the service today. Our sextons who work nonstop. Zoe, our junior high director. We have the best staff at Claremont UCC, and we are so blessed. But then there are volunteers that come into the picture, from our greeters and ushers to our PowerPoint coordinator to the deacons who set up for communion, our fellowship board who has treats prepared for Animal Blessing Sunday, our flower delivery team, our prayer team, our media team in the back, our acolyte who lit the candles. 
so much and so many people are involved. So thank you to everyone who makes sure we can worship to get together each and every week. For many pastors, and it's true for Jen and myself, planning and leading worship is one of our favorite parts of the job. Unfortunately, there's always so little time to actually get to do it. There's so much administrative work and pastoral care and emails and meetings and events and emails and, um, did I say emails? Uh, that besides the brief Tuesday meeting that I mentioned, that all of the worship planning just gets squeezed into evenings and weekends and whenever there's a brief moment. But then Sunday comes every week and it is pure joy to be together in the sanctuary and online. Uh, but in that description, there was one teeny tiny part of the preparation for Sunday that I left out, the sermon. I think it is a real benefit for a church like Claremont UCC to have co-pastors. That model is becoming more and more common because we get to hear from two different voices regularly through the year. And Pastor Jen and I really are two very different people with two different preaching styles and two different ways that we prepare our sermons during the week. As many of you know, before seminary, Jen was a creative writer, and she had been publishing a lot of short stories during her time in graduate school, and even though she pivoted into the ministry, her background as a writer comes in very, very handy for her. Because when it is her week to preach, she can put our daughter Clementine to bed, walk into our living room, sit down on the couch, and just start typing until she's finished her entire sermon a few hours later, she'll just all of a sudden declare, all right, I'm done. And I'll look at her with exasperation and shock every single time, thinking to myself, that is not fair. How could you be done so quickly? And it's not just done, it's a great sermon. It's not fair, people. Because for every one hour that Jen needs to work on her sermon, I need at least four. When it's my week to preach, first, I need a minimum of 30 minutes to read over the scripture passage that I had chosen months prior and then just pull my hair out and say, oh, why did I ever choose this passage? I've got nothing to say about it. I don't want to preach. <laughs> and once I have that out of my system, I'll take a few hours to research the passage and figure out what message I feel like people need to hear that week. And then once I start writing the sermon, for every 20 minutes of typing, I need at least one hour to procrastinate <laughs> by checking sports scores or reading random Wikipedia articles. I just have this need to read Wikipedia all of a sudden or going through the New York Times polls on the election. Even though I had just read them, I need to read them all again, see if anything has changed. And then in the middle of it, I need one more moment to just get up and pace and start moaning. Oh, this sermon is awful. None of it makes sense. I don't know why I'm preaching. Jen should just preach again this week. A little more typing, a little more procrastinating, and then we finally get there. But during this process, what's really helpful to me is that I have this shelf full of biblical resources, like commentaries or dictionaries in the original languages, or there's one book I have that cuts and pastes parallel passages that are similar to each other and puts them on the same page side by side. It's really cool. And then I have this other book. I thought I had it with me to show you, but it is 808 pages long, and it's called Hard Sayings of the Bible. And you would think, based on how our fundamentalist friends think about the Bible, that everything's just straightforward and clear-cut, you would think a book called Hard Sayings of the Bible would be really short. But that's not the case. 808 pages, size 10 font, that says that it covers 500 of the hardest passages to understand in Scripture. Now, we all know that every single passage in the Bible could probably have an entry in hard sayings of the Bible. But our Scripture passage for today from Matthew chapter 15 is definitely one of the most difficult of them all. The primary challenge with this passage today is that it presents a Jesus who doesn't seem to agree with the picture of Jesus that we get in the rest of the New Testament. The Jesus that we know is willing to heal or talk to anyone at any place, at any time. He'll talk with the Canaanite woman at the well in John chapter 4, even though as a rabbi he's not supposed to talk to women. 
He'll raise the daughter of Jairus, a Pharisee, in Mark 5, even though Pharisees are continually trying to hinder his ministry. He'll have a meal with Zacchaeus, the tax collector, in Luke 19, even though the rest of Israel reviles tax collectors. But in our scripture passage for today, a Canaanite woman comes to Jesus, begging him to help her daughter. And when the disciples try to turn the woman away, classic disciple move, by the way, they never get it. Well, this is the perfect opportunity for Jesus to proclaim to the disciples, don't turn her away. Of course I'll help this Canaanite woman. Our ethnic differences don't matter at all. And then as modern readers, we would read Jesus' response and we would applaud and say, beautiful Jesus, this is the Jesus we know. He loves all people. But that's not what he says. Instead, he tells her, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And so she begs him again, this time on her knees, Lord, help me. And again, his reaction seems so callous. It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. Yes, Lord, the woman says, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. She isn't asking for much, just the crumbs, the dregs, the leftovers of whatever healing power Jesus might have. Finally, Jesus is impressed with this response and commends her for her great faith, telling her that what she has asked for has already been done and her daughter is healed. But that doesn't change the fact that for some reason Jesus was so reticent in the first place. The primary way that biblical scholars will explain away Jesus' behavior in this passage is to remind us that while we have Jesus' potential words here, like any text message that we might send today, we have no way of knowing Jesus' tone. Perhaps he was intentionally regurgitating the same racist tropes that this Canaanite woman had heard all her life. But he did so with a glimmer in his eye to let the woman know that he himself did not believe any of it. And the two of them could share a moment of collusion as they rolled their eyes at how terrible those thoughts sounded out loud. That explanation certainly makes it more palatable. I like to think that Jesus enjoyed healing this woman in the end right in front of his disciples who grew up hearing those same racist tropes themselves. What I want to focus on in this passage, though, is the particular language of the racism because the words that Jesus and this woman use in this passage are just as common today as they were in ancient times. In the ancient Near East, to call someone a dog was a degrading insult. Thousands of pariah dogs roamed the streets of Israel and surrounding nations. They were considered evil because they traveled in packs and ate corpses and attacked people. Dogs were considered unclean and unwelcome, and so if you called someone a dog, then you were declaring that they were beneath you and unworthy of being considered human. We know that we still use the same language to dehumanize people today, don't we? You see it in the news all the time. During times of war, one side will refer to the other as animals. Just this week, a prominent politician in our own country declared that immigrants coming to the United States were not even human, that they were animals. In the midst of ethnic violence in places like Israel and Palestine, people will describe their enemies as dogs or animals. We use this kind of language because if we can consider someone not human, we think it gives them permission to treat another person poorly, with no regard for their emotions or well-being because they're merely an animal, a dog. And animals aren't treated in the same way as humans, supposedly. I'm curious, for anyone in this church who's become a member over the last 10 years, when you became a member, did you know what the United Church of Christ was as a denomination? Any hands? Like, you knew what this denomination was. I don't see a lot of hands. And that's okay. Well, most people don't join this church because they are familiar with the denomination. But the United Church of Christ is a Christian denomination that has always tried to be at the forefront of justice issues. When we hold our new member classes on Sundays, I'd like to share uh, about the UCC that was formed in 1957 
when several smaller denominations joined together in a sign of unity, including the Evangelical and Reformed Church, the General Council of Congregational Christian Churches, and the Afro-Christian Convention. The Congregationalists, which made up the bulk of the merger, were the very first denomination to ordain a black minister, Lemuel Haynes, in 1780, long before the end of slavery. It was the first denomination to ordain a female minister, Antoinette Brown Blackwell, in 1853, long before women's suffrage. And the first denomination to ordain an openly gay minister, Bill Johnson, in 1972, long before same-sex marriage was legalized. If you're ever procrastinating by reading random Wikipedia articles, the one on the UCC is a good one to read. It's long enough, it's good procrastination material. The UCC has always been committed to fighting against issues like racism and sexism and homophobia and is always trying to stay attuned to where God might be leading us next. And honestly, I believe on this Animal Blessing Sunday that one important path to justice is to stand opposed to the idea of speciesism, speciesism, or the idea that any species, like humans, are somehow superior to any other. Because the basis for the degrading language that is used in passages like Matthew chapter 15 is the idea that if someone is not human or is an animal, then they don't have to be treated with kindness and respect. But what if we treated all animals with the same love that we expect to be shown to humans? Then if you were to call someone an animal or a dog, well then no problem because we love animals and dogs. How great would that be? Biblical scholars actually suggest that that may be what Jesus is doing in this passage. When he tells the woman that you don't take children's food and throw it to the dogs, this woman is from Greek, from Tyre and Sidon. He's from, she speaks Greek. Jesus would have been speaking Greek with her perhaps. And he uses in the text a Greek word that is different than the one used for wild dogs in Jesus' time. He uses a diminutive, the equivalent of cute little puppy. The kind that we find welcome in a home under the dinner table that shares a meal with the family. It's another clue that perhaps he's letting the woman know that he's trying to say something different from all of the insults she's heard her entire life. She picks up on it and uses the same diminutive in her, her response. She says, yeah, those cute little puppies eat crumbs that fall from the table. In our Bible study before the service, we recently discussed an infamous passage from Genesis 1, when God gives the first humans dominion over the rest of creation. The verse has historically been used by people of faith to justify exploitation of the earth and its resources, and the animals that live on this planet with us. But we noted that the Hebrew word for dominion is the same word used to describe how God takes care of creation. We are meant to care for creation in the same way that God cares for us. Treating someone like an animal shouldn't mean treating them inhumanely. Someone agrees with me. <laughs> Instead, as people of faith, our great calling, the one that we have not yet achieved as a species, is to help creation flourish. This earth and its plants and the animals that live among us. On this Animal Blessing Sunday, may we commit ourselves once again to Scripture and God's great vision of a peaceable kingdom where all of creation can live in harmony with one another, treated with the same love with which we would want to be treated. If you're on board with that vision, let me hear either an amen or a bow wow. <laughs> amen.